Okay, I believe we are live uh, on YouTube. Good afternoon. This is uh, John Beekman from the Jersey City Free Public Library's New Jersey Room, which is a part of the Reference and Research Department. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to another of our irregular series on local history. Today, I'm very happy to welcome Dr. Donald W. Rogers, uh, legal historian Don Rogers, recently retired from Central Connecticut State University, has previously written on the struggle for workplace safety as well as the, as the history of voting rights. Uh, in his new book, uh, Workers Against the City, the, the Fight for Free Speech in Hague v. CIO, he provides a fresh look at that landmark Supreme Court case, which looms large in local history in Jersey City as one of the defining moments of the long mayoralty of Jersey City Mayor and political boss, Frank Haig. So based on a deep dive into court records of the case as it wound its way from New Jersey through the federal courts, ultimately being decided in the Supreme Court, Don first expands the context in which the case is usually described, bringing in labor history as the CIO challenged the older AFL's craft unionism in a drive to expand union protection to a wider range of industrial workers, as well as changing norms in police practice and the shifting balance of municipal, state, and federal power to regulate public space and expression. So perceptions of this conflict are based in the contemporary framing of fascist Hague versus communist CIO and ACLU. Um, that's to use the epithets each side used to, against the other during a series of confrontations in the streets and in the press uh, across 1937 and 1938. These perceptions have persisted through the present day, uh, Dr. Rogers contends, clouding a wider range of issues at play in this pivotal period in American political and legal history. Uh, by drawing an extensive archival study to create narratives uh, of the street and courtroom battles, this new work expands the context in which we can understand these events. Um, perhaps most striking for us here on this day, the late 1930s marks a shift in the ideological balance of the judici judiciary um, up to and including the Supreme Court. So with that, I will welcome Dr. Rogers and thanks again for being here, agreeing to talk to us uh, about your work. And before we get into your presentation proper, uh, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about what led you to this topic several years ago when you started your research, because uh, at that time it would probably not be quite as clear just how relevant some of these issues you talk about um, would become by the time it reached publication. So I have a very, thank, first off, thank you for the privilege of being on the program with you. Uh, and thank you for the privilege of uh, working in the Jersey City Free, uh, Free Public Library, a New Jersey room uh, archives. Uh, that was all very helpful. Um, I have a broad interest in the development of civil liberties uh, in the 20th century. Um, and as I learned about this subject, and traced its development over the course of the 20th century. I was struck by this case in, uh, in Jersey City um, because uh, it seemed to me it was not just a local case as it's often described, but it had uh, larger national implications. And also thought it was important that organized labor was involved. And organized labor is no, often not thought to be an agent uh, for, for, for promoting freedom of uh, expression uh, and freedom of assembly. So I thought that, that the case deserved a, a closer look. And, uh, and as I got more, uh, deeper into the study of it, I found out that there's a lot more to learn, both about what happened in Jersey City uh, and the connection of this case to uh, nationwide developments. All right, thanks. That certainly, uh, certainly proved to be the case. And uh, I, I appreciated helping you with the research when you were in the New Jersey room. It led me to some uh, some interesting resources and and I was learning from you even as you were researching this so um, it's really great to see the final product here and um, again just thank you for for joining us to uh, to share a little bit uh, about what you've written here my privilege uh, so with that I guess if we want to go into your 
you have some slides to, to yeah, show I have us? some slides and I, I'll say a little bit about the book and what I think it's uh, uh, most significant findings are and uh, share my screen have some slides that I put together for you. So the cover of the book I tried to put together is a, uh, a, a picture of a CIO rally uh, in late June 1939, something that the city prevented from happening for almost two years. And the other side is a picture of the uh, Jersey City Commission uh, with uh, Mayor Haig uh, right in the middle. So that sort of captures the idea of workers uh, against the city. Um, I thought I would begin uh, by talking a little bit about the controversy that led to uh, this uh, case of uh, Haig versus CIO, uh, which is a case that uh, centrally involves freedom of assembly uh, and freedom of speech in public places. Uh, and the controversy um, it evolved over really three uh, phases of in late 1937 to the summer of 1939. Uh, and the first phase is when the CIO that was then called the Committee for Industrial Organization later the Congress of Industrial Organizations, uh, was expanding its influence onto the East Coast, having won some battles out in the Midwest. They expanded the East Coast and attempted to enter Jersey City. Uh, and on November 29th, uh, 1937, um, outsiders in the CIO entered Jersey City uh, to uh, advertise a rally uh, at People's Center on December 3rd. And you can see these are these are labor organizers. Um, uh, you know, here is your, your the last uh, great chance you have for every worker in Hudson County. Hudson County is the seat of Jersey City, the biggest opportunity of your lifetime, the opportunity to organize for better wages, the security of your job, and, and for a better life under the protection of a CIO contract. So, so these these are labor organizers. And I like uh, the phrase below: "Be wise, organize, join the CIO." So um, these <clears throat> organizers uh, entered Jersey City early morning uh, on uh, November 29th, um, and uh, they uh, picked up their pamphlets and they marched down to Harbor Place. Uh, and there they were met by the Jersey City police who had been alerted that the, 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 these um, uh, pamphleteers were, were coming. Um, there had been alerts in the newspapers that the CIO was going to invade. It was a pregnant work, invade Jersey City. Uh, and the Jersey City uh, police met them, uh, advised them that they were violating a 1924 ordinance against uh, passing out pamphlets on the, on the streets. Uh, and um, as the police uh, warned them to not do this anymore, uh, the workers understood the implications of what they were doing because they shouted out, uh, we have the right to distribute circulars. We, have, we want our rights The hell with your phony ordinance and probably not, not too smartly, they said to hell with police. And uh, so uh, if you get this melee and the police bust up their, uh, their efforts to pass out leaflets, uh, they put some of them on the ferry and send them across the river to New York City on the uh, New York City ferry that's, that was called deportation. Um, some of the uh, onlookers were punched by, by policemen, some plain clothes, some in uniform, uh, and 13 uh, were arrested. Uh, and uh, we can't see the whole newspaper headline here, but on the right, basically it describes how the Jersey City Police, uh, um, you know, stopped this uh, event without much, you know, without much disorder. So that's sort of the first phase. And the second phase is a protest phase that lasts from December 1937 to the beginning of the federal uh, injunction hearing in June 1938. Uh, and this is where, um, the CIO and its ally very, very significantly. Um, uh, its ally, uh, the ACLU, we can't see Morris Ernst's uh, picture here on the far right. He was the attorney, New York attorney, um, uh, working for the ACLU, American Civil Liberties Union. Um, those two partnered together. The ACLU's involvement is very important because that shifted the controversy very, uh, in a pronounced way, away from labor rights uh, labor organizing, forming unions to uh, the civil liberties issues of freedom of assembly uh, and, and free to freedom of speech. And so the, throughout the next uh, following six months, uh, the Jersey City uh, uh, Public Safety Director denied uh, 
uh, public speaking permits, uh, and when uh, CIO and sympathizers try to rally anyway, uh, those rallies were busted up for police or, interestingly enough, by the, uh, the American Legion, uh, which uh, strongly backed uh, Bayer Hay. And this became a media sensation. Uh, John correctly you know, indicated that this became a kind of shouting match between Jersey City was complaining about communists inventing and invading uh, Jersey City. And on the other hand, the CIO, the ACLU and others were saying, well, uh, uh, Mayor Haig is acting like a fascist dictator. So you get this sort of anti-communism against versus anti-fascism. Uh, and then the third phase is when the, the, uh, uh, the street fight um, entered the uh, federal courts uh, in uh, June, um, uh, June 1938. The case was filed early in 1938, but didn't actually get entered court in Newark a district court in Newark. And uh, it's important to note is that the law was very much in flux, uh, is that the, uh, the uh, constitutional status of freedom of assembly had not been yet nailed down. So in many ways, the, the court proceedings, which will go from the district court in Newark to the Third Circuit uh, Court of Appeals in Philadelphia, and finally to the US Supreme Court, I mean, that whole process is partly is involved you know, in, uh, in nailing down the constitutional status of freedom of assembly in the process of determining that an injunction should be imposed upon Jersey City uh, and declaring uh, one of its ordinances unconstitutional. Uh, and eventually uh, this reached the Supreme Court and Supreme Court decided in favor of the CIO and the ACLU. And here is a, um, uh, a CIO cartoon depicting uh, their, their image of what they thought this stood for. And um, I have this in the book because it's not entirely accurate. And in fact, uh, the OIA's uh, um, um, site uh, on this case, which I just checked this afternoon, uh, doesn't have entirely accurate either. Um, and what, the, what it says that the cartoon suggests is that uh, Mayor Haig was sort of brought to account uh, this sort of out of control authoritarian in Jersey City by the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments, particularly the first, the first amendment. Um, OIA says the same thing that Justice Owen Roberts uh, said that actions taken by Jersey City Police violated the First Amendment. And uh, I, I noticed this, and this is not correct, is that Jer uh, Justice Owen Roberts' decision is based upon the Privileges and Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment without the, without the First Amendment. And so that caught my attention right now and made me suspicious that maybe other aspects of the popular image of this case as a kind of battle by, between a would-be dictator you know, the mayor of Jersey City on the one hand, and then, you know, liberty loving members of the CIO and the ACLU on the other hand, I thought that perhaps there was more to it uh, and there were more, more national issues to it. And, and so this is what I found out in the course of writing my book. Um, is this is really a national story, not just a Jersey City story. And so what I'd like to do, uh, John, if I may, is to sort of talk about sort of four, you know, uh, uh, conclusions I've reached about how this case is of national significance as well as, as local significance. Uh, and these involve the changes in the labor movement, which you, you mentioned in your introduction, um, the challenges to city government and the scope of municipal power. Uh, political, political rhetoric is very important, as John mentioned in our introduction. And finally, um, a, a transformational point uh, in constitutional law. And, uh, I think the Keg decision itself is a is a transitional decision. It doesn't, you know, uh, um, isn't the definitive ruling on freedom of uh, of assembly and freedom of speech. But it's very much transitional. It begins shifting the balance within municipal government from giving city governments broad sweeping power to regulate local uh, law and order uh, to uh, to protecting um, uh, speech rights and assembly rights under under the Bill of Rights. So, so let me talk a little bit about each of these points uh, one at a time. And uh, <clears throat> the first is I have two figures I talk about in the book, uh, Theater Brandel um, uh, in uh, Jersey City, I think uh, residents of Jersey City and people who know the history of Jersey City, they might recognize him, a very powerful uh, labor leader, uh, president of the Iron Workers Local 90, uh, Local 45. Um, and um, I take him as representing uh, what uh, labor, the labor movement was like in Jersey City before the 1930s. Um, it was small, it represented perhaps 20% of the workers in the cities. 
um, but very much part of the trade union movement. Uh, that is that these are workers uh, who organized by craft, uh, they protected their craft, uh, they protected the right of their workers to, to get, you know, to, to maintain control over those jobs uh, through work rules, uh, job actions, through strikes and pickets. So, so that was the, that was the, uh, the, the, the main character of the labor movement in Jersey City uh, in the 20s. And some other characteristics which are it, the interesting and important. I mean, the labor trade union movement in Jersey City was like Jersey City as a whole, is it reflected the ethnic makeup. I mean, the leaders are overwhelmingly Irish Catholic. You know, the Irish at this point are, are a minority, the large minority, uh, and a shrinking minority, but they're, they're, they, they, they run the city. The second thing is that uh, the AFL, the trade unions, were strongly anti-communist. Anti Anti-communism was deeply embedded uh, within, within the trade union movement. Um, as it was in other constituencies in Jersey City, uh, the churches, Roman Catholic Church, uh, the veterans uh, groups, um, other groups. So very, Jersey City is almost across the board uh, uh, anti-communist and uh, Mayor Haig will take advantage of that. Um, a, a very important point is that the, uh, the unions, the trade union uh, unions in Jersey City, um, um, those affiliated with the New Jersey State Federation of Labor, those affiliated with the Hudson uh, County Central Labor Union, were strong political allies of Mayor Haig. I mean, they worked hand in hand during the 1920s. Uh, Haig supported those unions, kept strike breakers out of town to, to, to not, not threaten those unions. And in turn, uh, these uh, trade unions supported uh, Haig politically, helped him on the local level, helped him with elect friendly uh, Republican and Democratic governors of New Jersey, very, very closely tied together. So what happens to the trade union movement is the Great Depression comes along, and like trade unions all over the country, uh, the, the, the great, uh, they are devastated by the depression. Their membership declines, they're not taking as much money in as much money in dues. Uh, the unions struggle to survive, and some of the unions uh, resort to racketeering. Just to, they use strong arm tactics to keep their men on the job. And that's one of the things that leads to uh, um, Theodore Brandel's uh, confrontation with Mayor Haig in 1931 over the construction of the Pulaski Skyway. Uh, this is a famous event um, uh, It's a, you know, uh, discussed in um, um, The Last Three Miles uh, by uh, Stephen Hart, a very good book. Um, and the, the way I see this is very, this what the, the, that fight between Haig and Brandel about was over whether uh, the Pulaski Skyway would be unionized and unionized with Brandel's men. Uh, you know, that's largely reflects how the interest of the trade unions and, and the mayor of Jersey City come into collision in the crisis of the, of the early depression. And the outcome of this is that, uh, is that Brando is eventually prosecuted for racketeering. Mayor Haig is in the lead of that. And uh, Mayor Haig uh, is, you know, plays a key role, you know, in breaking uh, you know, Brando's union, Teamsters, plumbers, steam fitters, uh, cleaners, so a number of the local trade unions were broken, largely because they're involved in racketeering. Um, and, but it's, we shouldn't, this is often attributed to Haig sort of deciding he doesn't like unions anymore and he's gonna break them. But what's happening here is that Haig sort of is, you know, is compounding the problems that trade unions are already having because of the Great Depression. And one other thing we should add is the trade union's not gone. The Hudson County Central Labor Union is still there. They, they're unhappy with Haig, but they're still backing him. The New Jersey State Federation of Labor is still there. They remain allies through the whole CIO affair. So, and then you get the other side, we can see the half picture of William Carney. He's the organizer from the CIO. Uh, he's a coal miner by, by um, occupation, uh, became a labor organizer in the um, CIO's Midwestern campaign. Uh, the Midwestern campaign was a really tough fight. And Carney very much uh, exemplifies that macho style, you know, of the, of the Midwestern CIO. And he, you know, just like he wasn't going to let uh, the, uh, you know, auto and steel executives push the CIO around, uh, he wasn't going to let Mayor Haig push the CIO around. So you've got that, that feisty, you know, uh, attitude. And so um, 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 Carney, um, sends the CIO into Jersey City um, 
from Newark. He's uh, based in Newark, sends the CIO into Jersey City uh, in the fall of 1937, and that causes the confrontation. And what this produces in Jersey City is a split in the labor movement. I mean, basically, you know, much like much of the country, uh, the CIO splits the labor movement between sort of the AFL, the trade union faction, and the CIO faction. So we have seriously John Lewis's uh, picture is, is cut off there. He was the president uh, of the CIO. So the labor movement is split nationally. It's split in New Jersey. It's split in Hudson County and split in Jersey City. And what happens is that the trade unions sort of, you know, join with Mayor Haig against the CIO. And they each have their separate reasons. I mean, the trade unions see the CIO as an organizational rival. Mayor Haig sees the CIO is a threat to, um, uh, you know, his political power. And, um, and uh, we know this because during the injunction hearing, Haig says the following in exasperation about the CIO, these outsiders coming in to invade as he sees a Jersey City. Why, says Mayor Haig in his testimony in the injunction hearing, why don't labor organizers organize with local groups? Why do they come in from Brooklyn and New York? And why don't they do it with the American Federation of Labor and Jersey City? So, so you see, I mean, it's a Hag is often branded as being anti-labor, but that's misleading because Hag is still very much in alliance with the with the with the trade unions uh, and, and the AFL, and that remains true uh, through through the uh, this the CIO and uh, Jersey City affair. So um, the CIO was very threatening uh, to many constituencies in Jersey City. Obviously, employers, the Chamber of Commerce, horrified by the CIO. Um, politicians don't like the CIO because of the, the ruckus that they, uh, they created in the Midwest. Uh, the CIO is moderate in goals. The CIO wants to create collective bargaining units and, you know, and uh, stable you know, um, uh, union contracts, but their, the style of the CIO is militant. They mass protests, uh, you know, sit downs, you know, and, uh, and that, that is a threat to uh, you know, uh, Mayor Hag's control over the city. And so I think it's largely for political reasons. I um, mean, that Hag is closely, you know, has close friendship with the Chamber of Commerce, but I, I, my conclusion is for political reasons that Hag, you know, is, uh, is frightened by the CIO. And so, so that's why we see Jersey City right from the beginning puts up a, you know, a resistance to the CIO when it enters in, uh, in November, 1930. Um, um, 1937. So, so uh, just, ahead, just before we yeah, move on uh, through that, uh, I was really struck in your book that, uh, was, I mean, Harry, Harry Bridges was also involved with the CIO. Mm -hmm. is, 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 that, is that right? Am I remembering that correctly? Uh, of the longshoremen? And I, I, know I don't know. Was... The, I mean, the, the, I don't know uh, when the, the uh, longshoremen affiliated with the CIO. Um, but at this point, I mean, he's a figure because um, um, uh, in 19, the end of 1936, the beginning of 1937, uh, there was a big um, longshoreman strike along the East Coast. It affected Jersey City, it affected New York, other ports. Um, uh, Jersey City put, it, put this down violent. Yes, control of the uh, longshoremen and the waterfront was a, was a key element of, of Hague's uh, E economic power as well, you know, as well as political that's power. That's right. So uh, the challenge that someone like Harry Bridges, a very radical uh, right. Seattle organizer, uh, right. posed probably, you know, colored his uh, Hague's response to this new, you know, industrial unionism. Right. Uh, well, that's true. I mean, I, it's I, I don't know that Harry Bridges ever, ever went to the East Coast, but certainly Jersey City City uh, the leaders thought that he was. Uh, you know, a mastermind behind uh, the East Coast strike. Uh, and so they were very horrified. And in fact, I mean, through the, um, the I mean, the Hall CIO trial, uh, I mean, the Jersey City was saying, you know, if we give the CIO, you know, even an inch of ground, you know, that that's going to allow Jersey, uh, the, uh, Harry Bridges to come walking right on into the city. So they, they see him, you know, as a real, real threat, even though um, he's not involved in the CIO entry in Jersey City in 37 and 38. He's not involved at all. 
uh, may not have been involved in, in, directly in the East Coast strike, but he's a, a very important figure uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, Jersey City you know, holds up as you know, the danger that the CIO represents, you know, the, the communist invasion. And I was also, you know, sort of struck in your in your book, your description of the the manufacturing base in Jersey City, and just the the large number of small manufactories uh, the, that maybe the AFL wasn't organizing in. And then you have these uh, factories that are moving to Jersey City to escape the labor laws of New York, like the uh, what was it a shoe factory? You talk about one of the this early furniture, case, the furniture factory, the furniture world. factory, right. right? So maybe you could talk a little bit about um, a little bit about that predecessor case, just to further set the change in labor movement stage. Right, right. And the, right, the Miller and the Miller case is important. So. Um, uh, you're right. Is I mean, Jersey City um, is not like Detroit. It's not like Chicago. It doesn't have big mass producers. Um, it has uh, uh, some railroad construction work, uh, uh, meat uh, packing. Uh, those are large plants, but mostly uh, Jersey City is made up of small businesses and small shops. So it's very decentralized. Um, and what happens over the course of the 30s? I mean, the um, I don't know what uh, what the workforce is like in 1933. But I mean, in 1930, the work labor force in Jersey City is about 140,000. 1940, it's 115,000. So uh, Jersey City got re hit really hard by the depression. I mean, that's a that's a big drop by 1940, and that probably was lower in the middle of the 30s, about 18 percent. So a lot of the the, the small of facts go closed, and what happens is new kinds of small shops move in. Including in the apparel, apparel industry, that's one of the so the uh, Unita Slipper was one of the notorious sweatshops uh, in Jersey City, um, and um, and uh, Miller Furniture, uh, which uh, it is sort of typical of what's happening. Miller Furniture was a company from Brooklyn um, that had a union contract under the a uh, one of the National Industrial Recovery Act um, fair codes of fair practice, uh, and. Uh, and wanted to escape that contract and then relocated across the river in Jersey City, which by the way, was a common pattern. It's the, these firms are not just going to Jersey City, they're going to other uh, New Jersey uh, places, uh, trying to escape their union contracts. And when the, uh, the um, um, uh, Miller Furniture came into Jersey City and hired non-union labor and a radical union, the Furniture Workers of America, not the employees, the former employees, but this other union threw up pickets uh, in Jersey City uh, around the furniture company. Uh, the furniture company got uh, an injunction to stop the pickets uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, the, the furniture workers did it anyway. Um, and um, and uh, the Jersey City argued that, look, these aren't employees of the company, therefore this is an illegal picket. And according to old picket law, that's correct. Not maybe not true in 1934, uh, but that they they sort of follow the old law, and this becomes a you know a, a, a cause celebre. And in fact, the ACLU, this is sort of this is in the phase of the when the ACLU uh, was still uh, lobbied for um, free speech by uh, supporting labor agitators. They're this they're right on the brink of turning to the courts as a way of defending free speech, but they haven't quite gotten there yet. So ACLU from New York sends over, you know, uh, um, uh, some, um, uh, you know, um, ACLU members to participate in this and to generate publicity. Uh, and in the end, what happens? It gets plenty of publicity. And here's real, what's really important: is that the trade unions come out and criticize Jersey City for preventing the picket. So here's a pull. This is that shows that the trade unions are still there and they push back against um, the Jersey City government. And Haig, by you know, by accident or accidentally on purpose, Haig was not in town. So the acting mayor Arthur Potterton came out and said, "Okay, we relent. We'll let pickets go up in front of Miller Power, you know, a furniture company. And by the way, we want to remind you all, we're a friend of organized labor." So, uh, so it's a very important moment because you know it shows that I mean that the trade unions were strong enough to get Jersey City to back down. But it shows that you know the Jersey City is going to is, itself is going to you know stand up against outsiders coming in and you know and demonstrating uh, within Jersey City, and that 
is, and I agree with John, is that that in many ways is a model for what's going to happen when the CIO arrives just a few few years later. So, um, so, um, so. Um, that's that segues well into your the change in municipal governance because you did sort of allude to the the previous understanding of uh, of the rights. So I think we're right. I can let you get back on track now. Sorry. Right. So uh, so I mean so um, I mean, the question is does Miller Pollard reflect a change in Mayor Keg's labor policy? Um, and my my view is no is what's happening is the labor movement is changing. You know, the outsiders are coming in and this runs up against the longstanding policy of the Hague administration to enforce law and order within Jersey City. And this sort of, this gets into the kind of leader that, that, that Mayor Hague was. Um, just a few days after the CIO tried to pass out their leaflets in November, 1937, the CIO News, which is the CIO's brand new newspaper, declares dictatorship is proclaimed in Jersey City. And that becomes sort of the image that we have of Mayor Hague today. He's a dictator that he runs and governs Jersey City simply by imposing his control. And we, you know, with, uh, with a tough police force, uh, with the democratic machine, which has organizations down to the precinct and block level, uh, by controlling, you know, the, the, the city employment by so many patronage jobs. So um, my discovery is I think that's, that's an overstatement, is I think in many ways that, that Mayor Hague was like Life Magazine said in February 1938 that Jersey City Mayor Hague was last of the bosses, not first of the dictators. That, that Mayor Hague was really acting very much like a political boss as other political bosses did Although, as one of his critics, this is a labor lawyer, Abraham Isherman said, is that boss hag makes, takes bossism to its ultimate limits. And I think that that's a good, good statement. Um, and so um, how is a boss different from a dictator? Well, again, a dictator imposes control, uh, but city bosses, as you know, more recent scholarship shows, city bosses rule and govern by making bargains with their constituents. I mean, they get their inner city constituents like those, you know, in the working class districts, particularly the Horseshoe, which is the upper east uh, side of Jersey City where uh, Mayor Hay grew up. They make bargains with those voters in return for their votes. And what does, what does uh, Mayor Hay promise to Jersey City uh, uh, voters? Uh, um, patronage jobs, and that's especially important in the depression. Um, symbolic leadership. I mean, Hegg says he just like I'm. I'm just like you. I was born on a kitchen table in the horseshoe, you know, and I a very humble beginning, and I rose up to be an influential person, you know, as Irish American, and so can you. So that was very important. Uh, petty favors. Um, so, um, so uh, Boss Hegg, you know, appealed to to uh, to city voters that way, and including with the personal touch. And this leads to one of the most famous, I think, misunderstandings about Boss Hag, and that is his infamous, I am the law statement. And um, this was, I think, when he ordered it, a typical statement that a city boss would make. Uh, he was speaking to a religious meeting in uh, no, early November, 1937. Uh, and he was talking with some truant officers who said, look, you know, these young men are truant from school. I mean, we, we have to send them back to school, you know, and Boss Hag says, wait a minute, we can't do that. And the, the, these truant officers said, well, well, you have to do it because of the Jersey, New Jersey law, the Working Papers Act. And Mayor Hag responded by saying, no, you know, listen, here is the law. I am the law. These boys go to work. And what Hag was thinking, look, these young men, they're just going to get in trouble again. They're going to go through it again. So let them go get a job, let them mature, and maybe they'll, they'll consider to go back and finish their education. Now, this is typical bosses, the way bosses would bend the rules on the local level to please their local constituents. And so uh, it's covered up by our, you know, our um, uh, faces there. Uh, but this is very similar to a statement that jo James Michael Curley said in Boston. I mean, Curley said, you, you know, city rulers have to, to lead, even if you have to break a few laws and tear up red tape. So this is really 
you know, the, the, this, the, the I am the law statement is really a reflection, you know, of sort of you know, Hag's, you know, bending the rules to give the personal touch. Where Hag failed, however, is he became, remained such a bully later on that when William Carney coined that term, I am the law Hag, the label stuck. I mean, so Hag's behavior later, later, later on, you know, basically, you know, makes him quite guilty of having that label stick. So um, just a few more points about Hag and, and his, uh, his method of ruling and why there was this confrontation with the CIO. Um, interestingly, Hag was a second generation boss. I mean, city bosses in Jersey City go back to the 1880s, 1890s, but Mayor Hag uh, rose into municipal politics in the 1910s, second generation Irish boss in the middle of the progressive era. And so ironically, Mayor Hag was boss and also part progressive reformer. I mean, he's part of a major reform in city government. That's the creation of the city commission uh, in 1913, and I share with you this uh, cover of the city of municipal, municipal uh, minutes, which sort of shows you sort of the, the, the mission statement of Jersey City under the commission government. I mean, I like the slogan at the bottom, the gateway of municipal opportunity. You know, so later on, Mayor Hague is gonna be accused of favoring business when he says, you know, uh, everything for industry in Jersey City. In many ways, that slogan is planted in the sort of the political culture of Jersey City. So he picks up, picks up, picks up that, that slogan. But more importantly, Mayor Hag was a police reformer. This was a major reform of the progressive era because police, city police departments were corrupt. They're very much part of the old fashioned decentralized city political machines. And under the consolidated city commission, uh, Mayor Hag basically um, centralized the police department and himself became a, what one historian, uh, Paul Boyer, called a coercive moral reformer. That is, that Mayor Hag makes a name for himself by promoting sort of moral control in Jersey City and keeping out crime. So Hag is talking about, you know, Jersey City is the cleanest city in the country, the most moralist city in America. In Jersey City, there's no vice, no crime, no racketeering. And so here's a quote which I think, think captures the spirit of, of Hag's attitude toward policing. Uh, this is a, a statement he made in the mid 1930s. There are no gangs in Jersey City, said Mayor Hag, because all suspicious characters are apprehended wherever they are seen in automobiles or trains or on the street. If they have a criminal record and no good reason of being here and no miserable means of support, we slap them in the penitentiary for 90 days. And I wanna tell you, they stay there for 90 days. When we let them off the rock pile, they're not anxious to go back to Jersey City. And that sort of captures, you know, the the uh, sort of the, the law and order attitude he had. And the interesting thing is, this is not unusual. Um, and even a uh, mayor like Daniel Hone, socialist of Milwaukee, was saying practically the same thing. So, so the point to make is that you know, is that Mayor Hag's style of policing was very much in common with the police reforms of the progressive era and the police reforms of the 1930s. And Jersey City tried to sort of make a model of itself as being a model modern professional police force. In fact, Jersey City set up a police training academy, you know, where the, where the, the police officers would, would work out and build up their muscles, you know. And so, 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 I mean, so with that view, I mean, Mayor Higgs was, is he didn't want any disruptors coming, coming, coming into the city. So, and um, we have to add that, I mean, the other side of the coin of sort of the Mayor Hag's, you know, keep the clean the streets clean, you know, law and order style is that Mayor Hag most certainly used the police for political purposes to beat up, you know, literally beat up dissenters. A famous one that got roughed up a lot was James Jeff Burkett. Uh, there's a, uh, a photograph online. I can't show it to you because it's under copyright. Uh, but it shows Burkett with a muzzle on his mouth and with a sign saying, I cannot say a word, I've been gagged by Hag the tyrant. So, so Hag used the strong arm police against you know, uh, his uh, political dissenters. That's sort of the, the other side of the coin. <clears throat> and Hag was also known as were bosses for election fraud. And this is particularly true in the gubernatorial election of 1937, which is very important 
uh, to our story. Um, and because uh, 1937, this is November 1937, within three weeks before the CIO was going to come into New Jersey City, uh, there was a disputed election <clears throat> between um, Hague's favorite Senator A. Arthur A. Harry Moore um, and Republican Presbyterian minister from Essex County, Lester Clay. Um, and uh, Harry Moore won that election by 45,000 votes out of 1.4 million votes cast. So it's a pretty close election. And the, the remarkable thing about it is that Clay, the Republican, won all the downstate counties, which is sort of the rural part of New Jersey, won all the downstate counties, but in Hudson County, you know, one of the urban counties, um, uh, Harry Moore, uh, the, the, the Democratic candidate, Higgs, you know, ally, won by an astounding 129,000 votes, you know, and it doesn't add up. I mean, there aren't that many registered voters, you know, and Clay's investigators found out, you know, there's people voting more than once. This is before paper ballots, right? People were voting more than once. Uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, uh, iffy votes, of, you know, coming from, you know, uh, old, you know, old age homes and things like that. So, and, and Hague is under investigation and uh, Clay gets the recounts. In fact, a, a judge, uh, Judge Brogan, uh, who's a Clay Hag ally, allows a recount. So Hag is in big political trouble. And think about that, Hag is in big trouble. Republicans in the state legislature are trying to open the voting records in Hudson County to see you know, how the vote was counted. And it's just at that moment that the CIO shows up. So, so Hag is facing a political crisis. And so this sort of leads to an to, um, um, to, uh, important point. And that is that, um, at this point, the law is on Hague's side because the Supreme Court, although it's beginning to inch in the direction of applying the First Amendment on the state level during the 1930s, it hasn't quite reached the issue of freedom of assembly yet. And this basically what this means is the old law, going back to the old interpretation of the First Amendment, so we see part of it here, First Amendment says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or bridging freedom of speech or the press of the right of people to peacefully assemble. The Supreme Court back in the 1830s says, well, this and the other bill of rights don't apply to the states. So the, then the Supreme Court had not yet adopted the, the 14th Amendment to apply this to freedom of assembly. So that what the, the, so what's happened is, is, the, is the constitutional law had created a kind of shield for mayors like Frank Hague and other jurisdictions to basically uh, you know, get away with what they're doing because the federal courts have not basically found a reason uh, to intervene. And so what's happening on the local level is that uh, freedom of assembly cases are decided mainly by common law. Um, a common law that viewed the powers of a municipality very broadly, that you know, they, the municipalities had, the, had the, you know, almost a uh, ownership right over public property in the in the cities uh, to uh, um, you know control speech and you know and activities there. Um, the common law, the illegal assembly, uh, which you know put limits on what people could do in public. So so the point is, is that the local courts are deciding uh, freedom of speech in that way, um, and uh, and so this gives Jersey City some some it's a lot of power, and it's in and in, in in that sort of situation that Jersey City through the winter and spring of 1937, 38 rather, uh, that Jersey City shuts down the CIO operation and the operation of its supporters. Uh, the CIO can't get speaking permits. Uh, the ACLU can't get speaking permits. Other speakers try to come in. Norman Thomas tried to speak at a protest rally in April 30th without a permit. Uh, the police, uh, he, uh, Thomas literally arrives in his car, the police grab him, put him in another car, take him to the Hudson River Ferry and send him across the river to, uh, to New York City. Um, <clears throat> um, other, uh, the, 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 others try to hold a rally, the International Labor Defense, which is actually a, a communist front organization, uh, did try to hold a rally in Jersey City. Uh, but when that happened, the American Legion showed up, led by Hugh Kelly. Hugh Kelly is an interesting figure. Somebody should do some research on him. Um, an architect, former artillery officer in World War I, uh, when, when, the, when uh, the 
uh, you know, speakers in favor of the CIO or the ACLU showed up, you know, whether they're congressmen like Jerry O'Connell or Norma Thomas, Hugh Kelly called out the Legionnaires, you know, and said to them, you know, let's get ready. You know, and he said, quote, don't let us start anything, but we'll finish if they start anything. So the American Legion is supporting them. So, so you get this, this, this fight in the winter and spring of, of 1938, when the law isn't clear, the, the federal courts don't have a clear you know, jurisdiction to, to intervene yet. Um, and uh, in this juncture, then we get to my next point, I'm watching the clock, John. Um, we get to our next point, and that is that this becomes a rhetorical war uh, between, you know, between Jersey City on the one hand and the coalition supporting the CIO on the other hand. Uh, and Mayor Hag embraces the language of anti-communism which he first adopted back in the Miller Parlor uh, incident. Um, this is not new. Anti-communism was deeply embedded in American political culture. Uh, it was, you know, um, a festered from World War I onward through the 20s and the 1930s. Um, it's especially present in groups like the American Legion, police departments, the Roman Catholic Church, conservative employers, um, trade unions, uh, conservative politicians. So the point is, is that Jersey City was really a bastion of anti-communism. And what Mayor Haig was basically able to do was to tap in to that sort of latent anti-communist sentiment for political purposes. So, I mean, often it's portrayed that, that it, Mayor Haig sort of orchestrated all this, but in many ways he took advantage of the local political culture uh, anyway. You know, and so uh, he accuses uh, the uh, CIO and ACLU leaders of being communists. Here are some headlines. Um, Haig uh, gives evidence to show Baldwin is a leading communist. That's Roger Baldwin, uh, the president of the American Civil Liberties Union. Uh, Ernst, the lawyer for the, uh, for the uh, American Civil Liberties Union, he says is a radical. Uh, the other headline we can't see is Abraham Isherman, who was a labor lawyer in Newark. Uh, Haig says he's the red counsel. So, uh, so uh, Hag basically browbeats, you know, the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the CIO and their supporters as being communists, which he argues that Jersey City needs to keep out of Jersey City to keep law and order. Um, and um, so, uh, what Hag does is he basically rallies his base. This is what we would call it today. I mean, Hag is in trouble over that 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 disputed election. So, Hag and on January 6, 1938. Um, which I think has to be reinterpreted. This is often taken to be an anti-CIO, anti-labor uh, um, uh, rally. I think it's a political rally where a lot of different groups get together against the CIO, each for their own purposes. The trade unions are there. They don't like the CIO because they're political competitors. The Chamber of Commerce doesn't want the CIO in town, obviously. The Roman Catholics are afraid of, this, of, the, of, the, of the communists. Um, and Mayor Haig sees, you know, communists and CIO as a political threat. And what Haig is able to do in a kind of monster rally, the Americanism rally, you see this is a picture from the Jersey Journal, excuse me, Jersey Observer, you know, thousands of Jersey City residents show up to basically pledge their Americanism by opposing the CIO. Uh, and the interesting thing is that, you know, that uh, speakers there, you know, Congressman Edward Hart, says bluntly, this is not an anti-labor rally. This is against radicals. Um, this other picture here, we see it covered up. Um, this is one uh, uh, where um, um, Mayor Haig invites one of his fiercest rivals, a Republican, Robert Hickary, to join him on the speaker stand at this rally. So Haig even gets his fiercest Republican opponents to come and join him in this rally against the CIO and against alleged CIO communists. And so Hag is very cleverly sort of using the anti-communist issue to sort of bringing everyone together to solve his larger political problems. And that's why we, uh, we have um, uh, this comment. Um, we can't see it all here, but this is a, uh, a comment by one, a group of uh, detractors um, uh, uh, you know, the, against Mayor Hag, the Workers' Defense League, which is a New York group of socialists and one, this is how uh, one observer from the Workers Defense League described what Mayor Haig is doing. Caught in scandalous election frauds. Got that? He's putting election frauds up front. 
Caught in scandalous election frauds, Haig finds that Reds are about to invade Jersey City, and soon the cry of election frauds is forgotten and drowned out in the wild shouts of, the Reds are coming. Out come the bands, the faithful legion, the flags, out go civil liberties. Freedom of speech might again direct the minds of people to election frauds. So that thing shows you this is not, this is the large, about larger political agenda uh, that, that, uh, that Mayor Haig is facing. So um, opposed to Mayor Haig was this coalition against him, which is largely comes about because of the popular front. The popular front was a coalition of, of uh, New Dealers, socialists, CIO leaders, labor rights activists, journalists, even some communists against fascism as it was rising in Europe. And so you hear a lot of the people in that sort of that left coalition, the popular front, warning Americans that their democracy is under threat by would-be fascists, you know, whether it's Father Coughlin or Mayor Hick. And so here we see uh, some of the um, uh, some of the um, literature against Hag, this one by Norman Thomas, Hagism is fascism, captures the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, idea. Unfortunately, we got the best one is on the right, it's covered up by our, our faces. Uh, this is a New York Times cartoon, which shows Mayor Hag in a Nazi jacket with a Heil Hitler salute. And you can see the sign, this is Jersey City, keep out you. Um, and the interesting thing is you can see that it dresses Mayor Hag in a Nazi jacket, but he's wearing golfing pants. And in the background, there is a caddy carrying his golf clubs uh, and the caddy is labeled Jersey City taxpayer. And that alludes to the, the uh, allegations that Jersey City was going on corrupt Florida uh, you know, vacations at the expense of Jersey City taxpayers. So you get this rhetoric against him and it's really this anti-communism versus anti-fascism sort of rhetoric back and forth that sort of shapes our understanding, you know, the way we remember uh, Hag today. So the Hag versus CIO today. So, just to, just um, to let you know, Don, real quick, uh, what's what people are seeing on the YouTube stream is is bigger than what we're seeing on the Zoom here. So not everything that is covered up here in the Zoom meeting is covered up um, on okay, YouTube. So I hope they can so, see so, that whole. Cartoon. Yeah, that com that cartoon was there, loud and clear. Yep. Right. That's a that's a great cartoon. So good. Yeah. So, so in uh, early um, early January 1938, uh, the CIO and ACLU file a lawsuit in federal district court in Newark to secure an injunction against Jersey City to cease interfering with uh, the rights to uh, the uh, CIO and ACLU to get speaking permits, hold public rallies, pass out leaflets, uh, and, you know, being, uh, you know, um, deported from the city, to, to, to not have them deported from the city. And, um, a lot of people sort of look at this case as sort of, you know, a done deal that it's all, all that needs to be done is expose uh, Mayor Hag for violating uh, obvious uh, federal constitutional laws. But an important point to make is, is that federal constitutional law at this moment in the spring and summer of 1938 is unsettled. And the constitutional basis for freedom of assembly is not yet set. And so what has to be decided uh, in the federal courts as it goes from the district court in Newark under Judge Clark, William Jark, who is a Republican from Essex County, uh, New, uh, New Jersey. Um, uh, I mentioned that because uh, the Republicans in Essex County don't typically like Democrats from Hudson County. So, uh, so, uh, so from the district court to circuit court in Philadelphia, the Court of Appeals to the US Supreme Court, there's really sort of two legal issues that are looming behind this hind case. It's not just about exposing Mayor Haig for what's happening in Jersey City. One issue is how to strike the balance between the duty of cities to keep the peace and the right of people to peacefully assemble in public places. And that, that's a big issue to, to resolve. And, um, and Jersey City is arguing the old law, uh, which, uh, which uh, under uh, May, a Supreme Court case Davis versus Massachusetts from 1897 gives cities pretty wide, uh, wide scope in what they can do. Uh, and how will that will be balanced against new claims that, you know, that people have rights under federal law 
whether it's under Civil Rights Act from the Civil Rights uh, from the Civil Civil War era, or the um, Wagner Act, or the First Amendment, how are those two things to be balanced? That has to for federal courts have to work that out. And the other thing that the federal courts have to work out is whether the federal courts even have jurisdiction. And if Jersey City argued under old law going back to the uh, Reconstruction era of uh, Slaughterhouse and uh, Cruchant case cases that you know the federal courts don't have jurisdiction in a case like this. This is really a local matter to resolve. And so the courts have to decide that too. So, so this is the, the, these are legal issues. So we go into federal court um, uh, and the injunction hearing uh, in district court in June, 1938 is a really a, a wild affair, you know, where uh, the, uh, the ACLU and the CIO, the CIO has a lawyer, Spalding Frazier from Newark. They bring one witness after another, CIO organizers, uh, um, witnesses, including some women, some women get involved like Nancy Cox, the, uh, pre the uh, executive secretary of the New Jersey Civil Liberties Union, brand new organization. Um, they bring them to Grace Milgram, who uh, was a witness. Uh, they bring them to testify about the sort of the brutality of the Jersey City Police Department in shutting down the, uh, the, uh, the pamphleting drive, denying uh, you know, uh, speaking permits, deporting the protesters, um, and uh, you would think that Jersey City doesn't have much to argue back, but what Jersey City argues back doesn't deny most of this. What Jersey City argues back is that based on all old law, you know, is that Jersey City was justified in what it did. That what Jersey City had a duty and a right to keep, uh, to keep the peace. And at first Jersey City said they, they were authorized to do this because the CIO um, leafleters were violating this 1924 um, uh, uh, ordinance uh, that prevent, prevented uh, passing out leaflets on the street. Well, I mean, that didn't last long because the Supreme Court struck down a similar ordinance in Georgia and Judge Clark says, well, you know, it doesn't really apply. Um, and, um, and then, um, uh, so then Jersey City fell back on the argument. Well, we got to keep the, the CIO and its supporters out of Jersey City because they're communist organizers. So, so that was their sort of their last fall. And they, they presented testimony to try to say, well, that was our state of mind. And the most uh, dramatic part of the injunction hearing is when the, um, the uh, CIO and the ACLU got Mayor Haig on the witness stand. And um, uh, uh, Morris Ernst and Mayor Haig did not like each other. And they went after each other. So I, I compare it in the book uh, to uh, Clarence Darrow and uh, William Jennings Bryant in this ghost trial. They went back and forth and, and Ernst is clearly trying to humiliate him, showing him to be ignorant, showing to be a, him to be an out of control dictator. At one point, Hegg says to Ernst, okay, go the limit. Don't spare me because I won't spare you. Take off the gloves. And that's how feisty it got. Um, and in the end, in the end, however, um, th th this is a, uh, an injunction hearing a proceeding in equity. So there's no jury. Um, and so uh, Judge Clark uh, uh, imposes the injunction as the ACLU wanted. Uh, basically, it grants the ACLU and the CIO just about everything they want. Rejects Jersey City claim about the danger of communist subversion, saying the CIO came into to Jersey City for lawful purposes. Uh, and then in a really watershed moment, he, uh, Judge Clark, in a long decision, which is more history and political science than it is law, says that freedom of speech and assembly are a fundamental right of Americans. Uh, and this takes priority over a city's police powers. And so that marks a major shift because there you see the shift of the federal court shifting, you know, the, the uh, protections from protecting a city's right to keep law and order to protecting the right of citizens to, um, uh, to uh, organize and uh, speak out in public on public space. So um, this gets appealed. Now we can go to the next slide to the Third Circuit uh, in Philadelphia. And here you see some of the attorneys, um, Charles Hershenstein of Jersey City, Spalding Frazier from uh, uh, New Newark for the CIO, David Stauffer, Morris Ernst uh, for the CIO and Edward Romero for Jersey City. Um, you think this is gonna be a slam dunk. You know that uh, that the the, uh, the uh, third circuit is going to quickly you know rule to uphold the injunction, but.
but not so fast because there's some slimy or you know, maneuvering on the third circuit. So the attorneys show up and the rule of procedure is that three judges will hear the case from the third circuit. But when the attorneys show up, there are five judges. And what happened is that the judge, uh, the senior judge Warren Davis had called two of his retired colleagues out of retirement to sit and hear the case. So you have a five judge bench, which would allow three judges, Davis and these two retired judges, Joseph Thompson, and Joseph Buffington, to outvote the two new judges on the Third Circuit who are Roosevelt appointees, Albert Maris and John Biggs. Uh, and the, the attorneys from the CIL and the ACLU are shocked. They can't believe their eyes that this is happening. And one of them remarks is they thought they saw, quote, the spectral hand of head at operation, uh, in, in operation there. Well, um, for reasons that are not clear, the two retired judges removed themselves from the case. And now it's a three judge court. You've got the Roosevelt judges uh, in, uh, you know, uh, in the saddle. Uh, and the case is finally decided by the two Roosevelt judges, John Biggs and John um, Albert Maris. Uh, and John Biggs, um, you have a picture of him here in 1959. He produces what is the, is the most scorching criticism of Jersey City. Uh, you know, it, crit it criticizes the way that Jersey City, in fact, stirred up you know, the opposition to, to the, the CI co coming in rather than responding to the opposition, um, said that the Davis case was outdated uh, and argued that the, the Supreme Court cases of the 1930s had recognized civil liberties on the state and local level by incorporating the First Amendment speech and assembly rights into the 14th Amendment's due process clause. So he upholds the, uh, the uh, uh, injunction declares Jersey City's um, um, speaking permit ordinance unconstitutional. And, and again, a very important point says that under federal law, cities no longer have unrestricted police power. Now they are trustees for the people's right to speak. They protect their, their duty is to protect people's right to speak. It's a real shift in federal law. So it goes to the Supreme Court. And you think, well, again, it's gonna be a slam dunk. You know that the, the, the John Biggs on the on the uh, appellate level had you know issued this very strong ruling at Jersey City, but again, not so fast, because when uh, this gets to the Supreme Court, Supreme Court itself is in is in turmoil. Um, um, the Supreme Court um, is uh, in transition. Um, several of the justices have led, particularly two of the uh, ultra conservatives, George Sutherland and Willis Vanderventer, are gone and replaced by two um, 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 Roosevelt appointees, Hugo Black um, and um, Stanley Reed. Um, so you see that transition. Um, chief Justice um, Charles Evans Hughes is still Chief Justice, however. So in many ways, the Supreme Court's got one foot in the old era and one foot in the new era. Um, and then one justice doesn't can't hear the case. And that's a the eighth justice who was Felix Frankfurter. And because he was a member from the ACLU, he had to recuse himself from the, from the case. So we have seven judges who are going, justices who are going to decide the case. Um, and we might mention, I didn't mention before, is the ABA had entered the litigation with a friend of the court brief on behalf of the ACLU and the CIL. And it's, this is significant because the ABA, the American Bar Association at that point was a conservative organization. And they're now weighing in on the side, on the side of the, uh, freedom of assembly. That was the main point of their brief. So what happens uh, in, in, in the Supreme Court case? Well, it's split. Um, and um, the uh, five of the justices decide pretty clearly the injunction has to be upheld. Uh, the Jersey City ordinance, the uh, speaking permit ordinance is unconstitutional. Um, uh, that, you know, that uh, Mayor Hag has to let the CIO and the ACLU and their supporters hold their rallies, can't deport them anymore. The fight comes in the legal logic. What's going to be the legal logic? And the decision for the court goes to Owen Roberts, appointed by, uh, by o Herbert Hoover. And uh, Owen Roberts, uh, rather than picking up on the 14th Amendment due process um, uh, logic, 
he decides a case really on the basis of sort of sort of a transition from common law to, to constitutional law. He decides the case under the Privileges and Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment. And I mean, what the Privileges and Immunities Clause says is that no state shall deny any person of the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States. So it's a privilege of national citizenship for citizens. And it's a pretty narrow view because it's not everybody, it's just citizens, and it's only the right to petition Congress. And so I want to read what Justice Roberts said uh, to make very clear you know, uh, what, what, what he's ruling here. He said in his decision uh, for the court, which is only between him and Hugo Black, so it's a plurality decision, wherever the title of streets and parks may rest, they have immorally been laid in trust the use of the public and time out of mind have been used for the purpose of assembly, communicating thoughts between citizens and discussing public questions. Such use of the streets and public places has from ancient times been part of the privileges, immunities and rights and liberties of citizens. The privilege of a citizen of the United States to use the streets and parks for the communications of views on national questions may be re regulated, but is not absolute but it can't be uh, abridged um, in the guise of regulation. Now, the interesting thing about that statement is it doesn't mention the First Amendment. Now, basically what, what Justice Roberts is doing is sort of reading a kind of common law language, talking about custom and time immemorial, you know, to, to justify this right, uh, right for citizens. So he has a big disagreement with Justice Stone. And I, I, uh, I looked at the, went to the, to the Library of Congress and I looked at Justice Stone's records and there, uh, Justice Stone was writing mem memos to Justice Roberts telling Justice Robert, well, Roberts, your, your constitutional logic doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I mean, that isn't entirely persuasive. Uh, and eventually Robbins went, went his own way. And so Justice Stone wrote a concurring opinion arguing that Roberts had construed the case too narrowly uh, and should have decided the case under uh, the 14th Amendment Due Process Clause incorporating the First Amendment. And that really becomes the law of the future. But it's only a concurring decision which Stone, Chief Justice Hughes, and Stanley Reed go along with. Um, and the final thing is there are two dissenters, um, James uh, McReynolds and Pierce Butler, who would have decided the case in Jersey City's favor. Sir so Jersey City's favor. So. Um, so I mean that shows you that all law is not dead. So so I think the fact the case the decision is so fragmented shows I think how undecided the law was. So quickly I know I'm over time, John. So I'm just going to conclude quickly. Um, what's what's the outcome? So many outcomes of all this. Um, so one is I mean the, the Supreme Court upheld the injunction, um, declared Jersey City's uh, um, speaking permit ordinance unconstitutional. There's nothing to stop the CIO or the ACLU from rallying. So that's what they do. So the ACLU and the CIU hold separate rallies, you know, to celebrate the fact that they can speak in Jersey City. Um, and it's interesting that they held separate rallies because what this is signaling is that organized labor and the ACLU are going in different directions. And that labor law and civil liberties law are going in different directions. So, so that, that's, uh, that's one, one point to make. And we might add is that based upon this, uh, this decision, this points the direction for the Supreme Court from then on to, to uh, support the right of Americans to uh, rally on public space and speak freely down to the present day, you know, in, you know, even in recent protests. This, this is the, the law of the land today. A second thing is, <clears throat> You know, is that uh, the uh, Supreme Court, uh, despite the old Tanglefoot cartoon, um, um, upheld sort of the, the right of the CIO to hold rallies in Jersey City, but it did not uphold labor rights, the right to organize unions, the right to picket, um, the, the, the right to strike. That, that's a different, that comes out of different area of law. But nonetheless, the CIO becomes very active in Jersey City. And then, ironically, Hague Town becomes Union Town. The CIO organizes a number of plants, a gypsum plant, a cosmetics factory, um, um, steel fabrication factory, crucible steel is one of them. 
So CIO does very well. And ironically, most ironically, the CIO ends up endorsing Mayor Haig for re-election. It's the most ironic thing of all. So, so the, the, the CIO flourishes you know, in, from this case, despite the fact the case doesn't really decide on the law on labor rights. And the final thing is, what did this do to Mayor Haig? You might think it brought Mayor Haig down, but it didn't, it barely dented his influence. Um, and in fact, I mean, he continued on in power, leading his machine for another 10 years. Um, he did surrender control of the mayoralty to his nephew, Frank Egg Eggers uh, from 1947. This is a Jersey, Jersey City photo, John. So I got that from Jersey City. Um, um, and so uh, Hag continues on for another 10 years. And what brings him down is not the Hag versus CIO decision, is, is basically um, what goes on within his political machine. Um, is uh, What happens is, um, is um, the Hag versus CIO decision does quietly behind the scenes turn President Roosevelt against Hag. And President Roosevelt quietly supports Charles Edison for governor. And Haig supports Edison because he's Democrat, but, but, but turns out Edison's an anti Haig Democrat. And so that, that sort of signals the sort of the, the, the political tide begins to shift against Haig, but Haig hangs on. Um, um, and um, uh, so Haig gets through the election fraud uh, scandal. Uh, he incorporates the CIO into his political coalition. Um, uh, Abraham Isherman, you remember he called, uh, Haig called Abraham Isherman the Red Council. Well, Haig takes his brother, Abraham's brother, Morris, as his labor advisor. So Haig, like he usually did before, you know, anybody who's an opponent and you can't beat them, he'll just bring them into his coalition. And that keeps him in power for another years. And what finally did Haig in, uh, in the long run, was, was a revolt within his own organization. Is that Haig did not mind the fact that many Italians, many Poles, you know, many Jewish people were moving into Jersey City and he's not giving them, you know, peace of power. And so one of Haig's, uh, a member of his, uh, his machine, John Kenney, revolted in 1949 and basically pushed Haig out of control of power and that ends the Haig regime. Uh, but notice that, that that only very indirectly has much to do with Haig versus CIO. So, um, so um, in conclusion, John, um, I hope that in my book, and I've given some in, uh, you know, insights into the contents, I think we can't look at Haig's uh, and CIO as just a local fight. It's just a just a local story. Um, um, you know, it reflects on changes, national changes in the labor movement. Uh, reflects that uh, rhetoric of the late 1930s of anti-communism versus anti-fascism. Um, it reflects the um, the uh, shifts in political power within the city, um, and especially reflects the rise of the civil liberties revolution. So. Um, um, I think, you know, uh, for, this is not a, just a Jersey City story, it's a national story. And I think, you know, that hopefully if your viewers and readers will, will pay attention to it. All right, thank you for that. Um, and again, um, the book is, I'm gonna hold it up here, uh, Workers Against the City, The Fight for Free Speech in Hague v. CIO. This is, uh, Hot off the presses. I think it's actually the date of publication is actually Monday. It is. <laughs> so yes. we're 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 in advance of that. I, I don't even was, have a copy. Have a copy <laughs> they, before me. they were very kind to send me a copy to look at, and I can attest it. It does a great job of um, turning really extensive research into a great narrative. You know, just by focusing on this really three or four year period in Jersey City and national history, where just so much is going on. Uh, so I uh, hi, hi, highly recommend it. And we are a little, we're past the hour mark, which is sort of a conventional limit, but um, if you're willing to spend a couple more minutes, we can see if any of our guests here have questions. Um, you know, Joe Murray, who, who has made some documentaries about Jersey City, certainly so another Jersey City questions. scholar. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll know, you, know, you can see the comments here. He's mentioning that the AFL was, uh, Haig was pro AFL and ILA as long as they played by his rules, certainly. So, so I'm looking um, for. And uh, Michelle mentions the similarities with Trump uh, being astounding, a sort of uh, 
and especially in the golf pants in that uh, cartoon. I don't know that that's probably a bigger issue than we uh, want to go in here in five minutes. But it's I think when you people read the book, they'll see the parallels um, between the present day and as I was talking to you before, this moment of transition in. Uh, whereas what you would call federalist judges of the old Supreme Court were giving way to a new deal and progressive judges, um, something that would go over the next 10 or 20 years and that we may possibly be seeing the um, opposite end of in our present day. But uh, I don't know if there's any comments you wanna make on that or if we'll just see if there's anybody else wants to add a question while, while we're wrapping up here. I know that was a lot, I know. So I, I want to make a comment on Joe Murray's uh, remarks. And I mean, I think he's right. I mean, uh, Hague was pro AFL, pro ILA, uh, as long as they played by his rules and it cooperated with his machine. I think that's absolutely right. And I mean, what got um, Theodore Brandel in trouble was that Brandel uh, dis disagree with Hank. And uh, there, I mean, before the um, uh, Pulaski uh, Skyway uh, controversy, um, um, uh, there was a fight between Brandel and Hague over unionizing the construction of a powerhouse for the hospital. And Hague uh, um, you know, brought in union labor, but they weren't on Brandel's uh, list. And Brandel got very angry about that, threw up pickets, and eventually uh, uh, Brandel forced Hague basically to buy out the contract, the original contractor, you know, and uh, pay a big expense to, uh, to uh, bring uh, Brandel's men onto the site. Um, and Hague never forgot that. It was one of the few cases where Hague got beaten, you know, and, uh, and uh, so you're, that just shows, you know, you uh, don't cross Hague, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and that's partly why he opposed the CIO, um, William Carney. I mean, William Carney uh, actually passes away shortly after this. Um, he dropped dead on the street of a heart attack. Um, and so, but, but uh, William Carney was not someone who was gonna be co-opted into Hague's organization. And one of, the, one of the reasons why Hague was able to do that later on is William Carney sort of passed out of the way. So, so I think the point is absolutely right that you know, the Hague is willing to work with organized labor if they work with him. And yeah, the, the, the adaptability uh, of Hague, even in the, as you point out in the face of this, what's sometimes portrayed as a, as a moment of faltering or the beginning of the end is maybe overstating it because he certainly carries on well into uh, the next decade. And again, um, Joe Murray in our previous talk here that you can find on YouTube has a nice uh, video and talk about that point in Jersey City history, just to tie it all together here. Um, so with that, I'm going to uh, thank you again for visiting with us here to, uh, today, Don, and thanks for everybody who's been here with us on Zoom and who are watching on YouTube. And uh, thank you for yeah. staying with me as my, my talk turned out to be longer than I expected, but there's a lot there, a lot, there's a, it's a, a big story. There, there, there's a lot there and you, you, you tell it well. All right, so now I'm going to end our live stream.